So I don't cry a lot. I try not to. I haven't cried in like maybe, I think 2002, 2003 was the last time I cried. That's what this story is about. I cried a lot when I was a kid. A goldfish died. I cried. It's not that he died. It's how my mom buried him. Like, <laughs> we had this VCR, and my mom, we went to Woolworths. That's how long ago this was. <laughs> to a store called Woolworths, because that's where you buy animals from a variety store. It would be like pants, toys, live animals you could buy. And my mom bought this goldfish and she put it on top of the VCR. And we didn't know about, you know, it's a fish. We didn't know that if you put a fish bowl on top of a VCR and then you watch eight episodes of Dynasty in a row, <laughs> that it would heat the water and the fish would die. <laughs> and she put it in the toilet. She put my goldfish in the toilet. She, she put it in the toilet and then, then she sat down and she peed, she peed. <laughs> on top of Henry. And I go, why did you do that? She said, I didn't want to flush twice. I cried, I cried. Not because the fish was dead, because he buried in urine. And he, he deserved better than that. My mom got robbed at an ATM in the 80s in Memphis. And she called to tell me about it. And I cried about that. I cried. Um, Cried during baseball a lot, because I rode the bench, so you know. <laughs> Not at the game, I'd wait till I go home to just kinda let my eyes well up, because I wasn't good enough that day, and you know, dealing with failure and stuff like that. Just, you know, I didn't, I didn't take stuff like that well. Ironically though, never cried when I lost a f any family members. I've never cried then. I had an aunt that died to a DUI uh, a DUI driver hit her. Um, I think I was like nine, maybe 10 years old. That was the first family member I ever dealt with that died. And it's kind of surreal because it's weird when you're a kid and you go to your first funeral because you see everyone else around you f feeling pain and everything, but you just like, I don't you can't muster it as a kid. My father died, but that was from cancer. And, and cancer is a different type of experience for the survivors of the person who died. Because as they go on their journey through chemo and whatever and everything, at some point while they're still living, you make peace with the fact that they're going to die. So that when they die, it wasn't as much of a shock, you know? So it didn't, for me, it just didn't hit me at my father's funeral because I felt like we had enough real conversations and enough good moments up until his death that you know, we were, we were at peace. Um, I cried in the sixth grade because cause I, I, I was flunking geography. I didn't like the teacher. She was, she was a jerk. <laughs> you know, and I was a gifted kid and I knew all the states. <laughs> you know, like, and, and that's the thing is that when the teacher's teaching something you already figured out from a where's Carmen San Diego floppy disk. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of boring. I'm gonna make paper airplanes and shoot spitballs. So that's what I'm gonna do. So she gave me an F out of spite. And so my mom cried. I brought the F home, I set it on the table. And my mom, you know, she's worked twice as hard as anybody I've ever known to try and, you know, make my life comfortable, you know? And she would buy all of the extra you know, the standardized testing books and any educational tools I needed. I had the best pencils. I, I went to, I had number three pencil, damn it, I didn't do anything. 
you know, whatever you need to be good scholastically, I'm gonna make sure you get it and everything I'm doing and there's nothing more I can do to help you and you still bring home Fs. And my mom cried and I looked her in the eyes and I could see the hurt and the disappointment and I started crying. And so that was the last time I cried until 2003. So I started doing comedy in 1998 and you gotta, you gotta understand, I was 19 when I started. So it was kinda, I had an easier go because I was in Tallahassee, I was in school at Florida A&M, and I was taking the Greyhound anywhere I could go on the weekends to go and do five minutes of comedy. And it, maybe it was smart, I guess, it, I guess it's working out, but I missed every major internship opportunity while I was in school because I was always on the road. Every summer, I chose to spend in some weird hell hole of a city. Like one night you're telling jokes to dope boys, the next night you're telling jokes to rednecks. It was a very eclectic upbringing. <laughs> so when I graduated, I didn't have any job offers. I had two, but they were both within $1,000 of what I was already making for the year doing stand-up comedy. I was averaging about $12,000 at that point doing stand-up comedy while I was still enrolled, which to me, that was a lot of money. I mean, my expenses every month was like $300, you know. Maybe an extra 100 doing football season because we got NFL Sunday ticket and we needed to see all the games. And so I had a job offer from the Tampa Tribune for 14000 and the Birmingham News was gonna pay me, they were gonna offer me 10000 work in my own hometown. So I go to my mom, I go, yo, I'm making more, by my calculations, I'm making 12,000 this year. If I keep at this exponential rate, I should make 17.5 and I should be making 22K in the next two years doing stand-up comedy. In theory, neither of these two jobs are going to pay me that much in the long run, so I'll make a deal with you, mom. You let me live with you You let me move back in, and every year that I make more money doing comedy, I get another year to stay with you, up to three years. And I put it all out on paper for her. And she goes, you're on. Which isn't exactly the most reassuring response <laughs> from a mother to go, it's on, oh yeah. <laughs> But she agreed to it. God bless her for doing it because she wasn't pro-comedy. My mother's a college professor with three, four degrees hanging off the wall of her office. So when you tell her, hey, you know, I've been doing this whole telling jokes to drunk people thing. And I think there's gonna be something here for me if we just stay in this space for a couple of more years. Right now I'm making 12.5. Next year, 17.3 is what we're looking at. But that's early projections. <laughs> so it's hard for someone to support that. She wasn't against it, but she wasn't my most avid supporter then. She is now, she loves me now. Once we understood the business plan and all of that, but in those days, you can't walk off of the, I'd still have my cap and gown on, and this is when I negotiated this with her. Literally, the afternoon after my college graduation, we're at Sandra Inge's house and we're having the whole graduation dinner brunch with, hey, way to go, to, where you gonna put in a job? Well, you know, I got a gig in Biloxi tomorrow <laughs> at a casino telling jokes to gamblers who've all lost their money. <laughs> and it's my job to keep them happy and get them back out on the floor and lose that house. Get on back out on that floor, sir. <laughs> Don't be a quitter. But comedy, you know, the thing that my mom taught me and what I, what I learned later on in my career was that she was teaching me, you know, she was teaching me a lesson about self-reliance, you know, because I didn't get any help from her. And, you know, I chipped in on rent and bills and stuff like that. But for the most part, I was a road comic. And being a road comic when you start, it's different than being in New York or LA. You gotta drive 
every week, sometimes every day. Every day, you're in the car four to five hours to drive to the next city because most cities in the South, if we're talking east of Dallas, south of Charlotte, just that whole little southeastern kind of SEC region, pretty much every city has a weekend club and maybe one open mic. And for where I was at that point in my career, you're performing five minutes per city. So you would go to Atlanta on Monday and you do five minutes and then you would drive to the next city and do a little bit of time and you come back to Birmingham, you work a couple hours at Golden Corral, that would give you enough money to get back to the next gig. And I'm, you know, and I'm making a little bit of money. I'm starting to do okay and I'm not, you know, I've stepped away from Golden Corral. I'm ready, I've got my training wheels off. So somewhere around 2002, I'm at a point now where I'm making just enough money where I can live gig to gig. Can't have a gig canceled, but that's the main thing that always happens to young comics is you get halfway to the gig and then you find out the headliner that you're opening for, his, his coke dealer also does comedy too, so you're fired off the show. <laughs> or it's some guy that we normally can't book, we can book him, so we're gonna cancel you. And it was not uncommon in the South to be on your way to a gig and be canceled while you're driving. You're literally on the freeway and you get a phone call from a dude and he just goes, yeah, remember that $60 I promised you? Yeah, you don't come get it, it's not here for you. <laughs> And so I got a call like that. I was on the road, you know, and I'm leaving a gig in Nashville, and the gig is in Bloomington, Indiana. And so I'm headed up I-65, and I've done the gig that night, and I'm headed up to Bloomington because I figure, all right, I'll do the drive at night so I can avoid traffic and all of this stuff in the morning and I'll just get into town and the, the booker there had made arrangements for me to get an extra night at the hotel and even if he didn't, there were ways to finagle your way into a free hotel room. I mean, this is like truck stop lodge. It's not like a Marriott. Like you, It's like one of these horrible hotels where you open your door and it's the parking lot and like your car is literally <laughs> right there. You know, one of these little $30 prostitute huts. So I, <laughs> If I have to pay for an extra night, but usually you could go in and tell the guy, hey, I'm with the comedy show tomorrow, is it okay if I, and he'd give you keys. I get a call that night on the freeway, and I'm, I'm near Bowling Green, Kentucky, just north of the Tennessee, Kentucky border, and the booker calls me, he goes, yeah, man, the gig's canceled, man. That's how he talked to you, like he yells, just like, hey man, sorry, real sorry, bro, but you know, just some things came up, and just show's not gonna happen, but sorry, bro. <laughs> now mind you, at this point, I don't have enough gas to get home. Like, I literally don't have enough gas to get back to Birmingham from where I am. I have enough gas to get to Bloomington where my money was and that money was gonna be the gas money to get back home. And so I pull over and I stop at a truck stop and at this point, you know, my mom, I know she wants to be right. Cause that's a simple solution. Hey, yo, know, the gig canceled. Can your Western Union me 50 bucks? I just need like 50 bucks and that would be enough for me to get home. Can you just send your son 50 bucks? I have nothing in my checking account. I have $14 in my pocket. I, maybe this is enough to get gas. I figure $14 was enough to get gas money to go to Bloomington, but 14 is not enough to get back to Birmingham. Just send me 50 bucks, Joyce, and we're good. But I can't do that, because then she would win. So I sit at the truck stop, and I, and I start thinking. I'm just trying to come up with a way, you know. And it's cold. It's probably four, maybe five degrees that night. And I got the engine running and everything. 
got the heat going. And then it dawns on me, wait a minute. I'm wasting gas. <laughs> so I go in my luggage, throw on a couple extra layers. I turn the engine off. And I fell asleep. And it wasn't on purpose. I guess I was tired. I fell asleep. And I wake up like 90 minutes later, just, just violent shivering, like uncontrollable, like literally can't stop it level shivering. And I turn the engine back on and I heat the car back up again. And once it got to a comfortable temperature, turn the car back off, I went back to sleep. And I woke up again, again, violent shivering, frost on the windows. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing, man? Why are you doing this? Like, what the, what's the point of this? What's the point of sitting at a truck stop in Kentucky, shivering in a Ford Focus? <laughs> hey, screw you, it had a spoiler. It was a nice car. <laughs> All right. I don't need your judgment of my vehicle. <laughs> Pricks. <laughs> it's in those moments, man, where you, you question why you made the choice and why you're doing it. And I've always been a guy to believe that there's a way out, you know? You're never as screwed as you think you are you might be screwed, yeah. You might be in a very bad situation. You literally have, you cannot afford to go home and the only person that can free you from this, you cannot call. So I fall back asleep. I wake back up again, heat the car, I cry. Turn the car off, go back to sleep. Wash, rinse, repeat until like five in the morning. So I get up, I go inside the truck stop, take a piss. And I'm standing in line, and there's like eight dudes in front of me in line, and they're just they're regular dudes, but they kind of look like construction dudes. It's like they had half the gear, like they had like the boots, but he was wearing jogging pants. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, like, what construction site is allowing this type of attire? I don't know, if you're fixing a gym or something, is that what you wear? When you build a gym, you just wear jogging pants. But he had construction boots and the belt, and he's got the hat, and there's like five or six dudes in line in front of me. And a guy comes in behind me, and he goes, they're not gonna let you work today if you ain't got no boots. Oh, what, the, what are you talking about? He goes, you're working today, right? I go, what are, you, what are you talking about? He goes, everybody here, man, we work. We stop here, we grab our coffee, and then we go over to labor ready, and we sign in, and they assign you to a construction site somewhere in the county. And man, we go there, we work all day, and we come back, and we cash our check, and we go home. I said, y'all get a check? <laughs> he said, yeah, we get a check. I said, what, what, what? what? Where can you buy boots? <laughs> he said, they're right over there next to the CB radios. <laughs>